Good morning. Can everyone hear me? Well, first of all, I want to thank you for uh, allowing us to make this presentation. Second, I want to thank all of you for your interest in heart failure. Uh, as African Americans in this country, we've been very interested in hypertension. However, when you talk about heart failure, we are disproportionately represented, and I think we have to be just as concerned about heart failure as we are about hypertension, and we'll try to make the case for that as we make this presentation. There's our title slide. Uh, my disclosures, which I have to show you. I want to put up this uh, quote by Dr. Martin Luther King, because I think we'll try to make this point as we go through this presentation, and that is, uh, of all the forms of inequity, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and the most, and most inhumane. And we're going to talk about that, how important this is, because as we go through treatment of heart failure in the future, uh, there are certain inequities that will be very, very uh, interesting to see how they play out. The Affordable Health Care Act may not be the vehicle that will deliver health care to the most needy of our population. And certainly that's going to be a real, a real problem and a big issue for us. Our agenda is here. We're going to talk about some things, and you can read that in your brochure. One of the things that we'll talk about and make uh, an important issue for you, and that is the initials uh, GDMT, Guideline Directed Medical Therapies. I want to make one clear point for you, and that is when you look at the data, particularly talking about the ADHERE database, if you look at disparities in healthcare, if you look at those patients in the ADHERE database that were on all the guideline directed medical therapies, you cannot tell the difference between white and black. And that's a very important, uh, important thing that I want you to take with you. Our learning objectives are here. And uh, just a little joke. It's not going to take me 200 slides, but it could. <laughs> so what's heart failure? Heart failure is really a clinical definition. It's a clinical syndrome. It's a complex syndrome. And it involves the heart being incapable of maintain, maintaining cardiac output to accommodate the metabolic demands of the body. And most commonly, the most common symptoms that patients present with is dyspnea. You know, that is the most common. And remember, one of the real issues that we face in this uh, battle of, against heart failure is diastolic dysfunction, or better known as HEFPEF. That's heart failure with preserved left ventricular function because it encompasses 50% of heart failure cases in this country. And uh, for all the women in here, guess what? You are the most represented in that uh, age group and that uh, demographic. What is the etiology of heart failure? Certainly ischemic heart disease. Being an interventional cardiologist, sometimes they say the things that we do in the cath lab when we take care of these patients with severe ischemic uh, heart disease, we make uh, the substrate for future heart failure. I think we save a few lives, too. Uh, hypertension, ischemic cardiomyopathy, infections. In South America, certainly there are a number of infections, and we see patients with Chagas disease in San Diego. Uh, valvular heart disease, and certainly prolonged arrhythmias. This cannot be discounted at all, because I've seen patients who don't know that they have atrial fibrillation. In fact, in the largest heart, in the largest arrhythmia trial, the AFFIRM trial, patients that flipped in and out of atrial fibrillation didn't know that they did it. And so sometimes you can miss this diagnosis, and it's very important because these are patients that you can improve uh, dramatically with controlling their, their rhythm. Now, I'm sure you've seen this slide before. If you haven't, this talks about the various stages of heart failure, going from A to D, and all the things that you can possibly do uh, in terms of treating those patients. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because, you know, you will emphasize this a little bit later. What I will say, and that is, in stage D, you cannot afford to sit on these patients. There are three things that you can offer these patients, one of which heart transplant, two, 
an LVAD, left ventricular assist device, and three, hospice. And do not fear recommending hospice to a family, because I'll tell you the other data and the other side of this equation, and that is patients who go on hospice do, regular, do better than those who are referred to standard care. And uh, it's, it's an attribute to the things that you guys do, because many of you may be involved with hospice patients and the care of those patients, and that's very important. We know about the classification for heart failure. We've used New York Heart Association functional class for many years, and you can see what uh, the New York uh, Heart Association functional class represents. Uh, we also have the, uh, the new uh, American Society of uh, Heart Failure uh, guidelines, which is A, B, C, and D. Now, what about the epidemiology and incidence? One million uh, hospitalizations occur in the U.S. with heart failure. There are another two million that occur in which heart failure may be one of the diagnoses, but not the most important diagnoses. Uh, in 2013, office visits for heart failure cost $1.8 billion. That's a lot of money. And what we ought to consider in terms of heart failure, and that is that admission for heart failure should be considered as a sentinel event. And why? Because in hospital mortality is 2.5 to 3 percent. If you take the 30-day mortality, you go up to 10 to 12 percent, the one-year mortality at 30 percent, and the five-year mortality, it's over 50 percent. So it needs to be considered as a sentinel event, or as we say in the cath lab, this is a significant educational opportunity for you to change lifestyle. <laughs> now what about the disparities in epidemiology? Non-Hispanic blacks, African Americans, have an annual incidence which is quite high. Males, it's 4.5 percent annual incidence. Females, 3.8 percent, as opposed to white males which have a 2.7 and white females a 1.8. So there's a considerable difference. And more importantly, I would say we have an increased incidence that's 50 percent greater among African Americans than it is in the rest of the population. Or even making it more the point, and that is we have <clears throat> about 6 million heart failure patients in this country. There are 900,000 plus that are African American. So we are certainly overrepresented in that group. Hypertension. I'm a fellow of the American Society of Hypertension, along with many other things. And we need to consider hypertension because it's very, very important. We have a number of patients who aren't treated. We have a number of patients who are inadequately treated. A number of patients who aren't all on, are not on all the important drugs that they should be on. And it is the most common etiologic factor for heart failure in this country. Just to emphasize that, uh, I want to show you some data from the ERIC trial. 30-day uh, mortality, 10.4 percent. One-year, 22 percent. And the five-year mortality was 42 percent, 42.3 percent. And this was after a hospitalization for heart failure. In other stages, when we look at stage A, B uh, through D, you can see 97 percent uh, survivability at five years, going to 96 percent, 75 percent, and 20 percent. Now, we should not underestimate what stage A means. Most people discount that. But if you have the nidus for the development of heart failure, that's when you have that opportunity to say an aha moment that this is something we should jump on and be more aggressive in terms of treatment. And that is those patients who have the nidus, meaning they have hypertension, they have diabetes, they may not have any other thing. But these are the patients that clearly are going to be potential heart failure victims as we move to the future. Now, there's a significant disparity in hospitalization rates. African Americans, again, have higher hospitalization rates than do the rest of the population. And you can see the data from this slide. 
Uh, what about readmissions? This is a big, big issue. Uh, and readmissions, uh, if you listen to uh, a lot of people when they talk about readmissions, they sort of blame us as a medical community that takes care of patients because it must be your fault because these patients are coming back to the hospital. Well, that's not true. And they also put this in the form of looking at quality. If the patient comes back into the hospital, there must be something wrong with your quality in the hospital. Well, if you look at readmissions, 50% of those are not heart failure related. But heart failure is a part of that diagnosis. And as a friend of mine once said, who talked to you maybe a year or so ago, I cannot treat a hip fracture with an ACE inhibitor. So what about hospital discharge? Another significant uh, opportunity for education of our patients. And I would say a lot of times we don't do a good job of that. Uh, I look when I, I'm on rounds and I'm on staff at several hospitals, and when I'm on rounds, making rounds in the hospital, I'm looking at what everybody's doing. You know, the computer gets a lot of attention. And uh, we have things that we have to do, make, we have paperwork we have to take care of. And sometimes the poor patient's lost in this. And this is just a little joke slide I found. Recommendations or indications, uh, and down at the bottom, bad news, my bill's ready. <laughs> now, what about health care reform? Why is that such an important topic? And why did I put the slide of Dr. Martin Luther King to lead off this presentation? Because it has a significant impact in terms of what we will be doing for heart failure treatment in this country. And it, to quote a, a, this, the friend of mine, is health care reform a grand idea, an imperfect plan, or is it a failed hypothesis? Uh, only time will tell. However, it's going to be important, and I want to make that point. Remember, the Affordable Health Care Act was passed March, 22, March 23, 2010, and the Supreme Court upheld this. And it's very important that you look at what the Supreme Court said. Uh, the Affordable Health Care Act's requirements that certain individuals pay a financial penalty for not obtaining health insurance uh, may reasonably be characterized as a tax. And what they further said, which is even more important, it is not our role to forbid it or to pass upon its wisdom or fairness. You can see those who voted for it. Uh, the uh, Chief Justice passed the deciding vote. It was passed five to four, and now we have the Affordable Health Care Act. Well, there's some problems with that, and I'll come back to that. Now, why is heart failure such a big, important topic? Because we spend a lot of money. It is the biggest DRG for Medicare that we have currently. And that DRG is in excess of $40 billion. In fact, some of the latest data I had said that we spend $40, $43.1 billion in terms of uh, health care expenses on heart failure. Half of that is on hospital admissions. Now. There is something very peculiar about that, too, because as you know, as we went forward in 2010, there were a number of things that were enacted, okay? Congress was sold on the fact that this Affordable Health Care Act was going to be a pay-forward proposition. Well, what you know and what I know, and that is, if your patient is readmitted for heart failure in the first 30 days, you don't get paid. In fact, if you got paid, the, mo the government's going to take that money back. Now, if you think about it, $43.1 billion, take half of that, which is admissions, take 20% of that, which is readmissions, and you see that the pot of money that they will collect to pay for the Affordable Health Care Act is somewhere in the, near, in the neighborhood of about 5 or $6 billion. That's a lot of money. And you have to consider these things in terms of their fairness. Uh, is it fair that you get some get deducted money because a patient falls and breaks a hip, but heart failure is part of that diagnosis and is within 30 days. Now, our big issue is how do we merge quality and cost? 
you know, when you try to do that, you're on a very slippery slope. And, you know, you can't say that you did all the right things, but the patient went home, fell and broke a hip, ends up in your hospital. Ah, you get a mark on the bad side because this patient's readmitted. But yet, how could you prevent a hip fracture? And so that's the, that's the big elephant in the room. How do you determine what's quality as opposed to what's cost? And really, what is it all about? And my feeling that the heart failure epidemic is all about money. It's the largest single expense for Medicare. It's about 5.4% uh, of the national health care budget. And more importantly, it is one of the lowest qualities of life of any chronic disease that uh, family members and patients uh, suffer through. Now, will expanding health care benefits improve uh, uh, and help this, this epidemic? Well, there may be some question about that, but uh, here's how it's going to be paid for. One of which you know about some cuts to hospitals. And, and from the data that I have here, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of about $260 billion. Uh, and going to uh, uh, dish payments, you know, I'm not sure if many of you uh, work in hospitals which take care of a number of Medicare or Medicaid patients, Medi Medi-Cal in California, Medicaid in the rest of the, of the country. But in those hospitals, those dish pay payments are going to go away. And some hospitals are on a very small margin that those dish payments really make a big difference. And so one of the issues that we'll be faced with, not only about the disappearing uh, of that payment, but also perhaps the increased readmissions, mainly because those folks may not have access to health care, and I'll get to that point. And then their hospital cuts, which you can see here. Now, important in our understanding is who are the patients who are uninsured? Uh, there are 48 million. Now, most people have a misconception of this, and I just want to go through this. 93% have incomes under 400% of the poverty level, and that's the government standard for how you can get access to uh, having a stipend to help pay for your health care costs. 75% of those are in working families. And to give you an example of how, what significance that is, there was a gentleman who uh, uh, it was either on television or on the radio. He had a choice to make uh, between insuring himself or insuring his wife. His wife had cancer. So he made a decision to insure his wife. Well, what happened to him? He was involved in an accident in the hospital, and you know what those costs were. So those are the significant issues that we face. And remember, this is in working uh, families. 45% of these folks are women, 55% men, 45% white, 32% Latino, 15% black. 78% of these patients who could be a covered are unaware of the new coverage options, which means that they're probably not going to benefit from this. Here is some of the insurance payments of how uh, payments are being made uh, in this country, insurance coverage by the non-elderly race and ethnicity. Uh, you can see that uh, in white, uh, uninsured 13%, Medicaid uh, 16%, and other employment. And then you go all the way through and you see how that's broken down. One of the things that we see that's going on, and that is payments by government continues to rise while other forms of payment for health care continue to fall. And uh, that's an important uh, topic. Now, there certainly are some, uh, some tensions in this health care system. As you all are aware, that salaries for CEOs who run health care systems keeps rising. And uh, the most recent article where I got out of modern health care, I got this article. And that is they say that they want to tie salaries to uh, quality. Mm. And so how this is going to be done how whatever metric they use, this is going to be the metric that determines how much a healthcare executive gets. Well, uh, this keeps moving. Uh, I just put this guy as the poster. I didn't mean to make him the big fall guy. But uh, his salary for 2013 was $51.7 million. 
Uh, and if you look around the country and you go to healthcare systems, uh, those CEOs for healthcare systems are making uh, s six and seven digit salaries. And uh, it's, it's kind of interesting. One of the uh, families uh, that I take care of, their daughter's a cardiology fellow at Bowman Gray. Hopefully she'll be joining me. And uh, they, she told me, just laid off 25% of staff across the board because they were anticipating what the health care cuts were going to be. Now, I'm not sure whether that CEO had a cut also, but you can see the problems that we face and all the tensions and that we face in, in health care today. Now, I put this slide up because this is an important slide that has some very important implications. Remember, you could opt in to the Affordable Health Care Act by state. It was not mandated by state that you do this. Some of the states may, uh, decided to opt for this, but there are a number of significant states that did not. Importantly about this, if you opt in, then whether you receive a stipend, a stipend for your health care depends upon uh, what the state either sets as poverty or the federal government sets as poverty. You can receive a stipend for your health care benefits if you are less than 400 percent of poverty level. Now, what does that mean? For a family of four, it's about ninety-three to $95,000 a year, and on down to a family of one, which is, you know, somewhere around twenty. Uh, but importantly, if the state did not opt in, the states then set what their poverty level will be. And in some states, that poverty level goes down to $3,000. Now, that's $11 a day. Uh, if you think you can pay for health care at $11 a day, feed your family, live in some place that you can, can live in, uh, that's going to be an impossibility. So I just wanted to put that up. Now, why are all these costs so significant in health care? Uh, because we spend a lot of money, and we're not sure that we get what we should get out of health care costs. And we have lots of discussions about who feels health care costs, uh, who's responsible for health care costs. Some economists say that uh, technology is part of the big driver. But if you take a survey and you ask physicians, who's responsible for health care costs? Anybody got an answer? Physicians are going to say lawyers. <laughs> because when you think about it, think about the doctor in the emergency room. Okay? He has these complex patients to take care of, and it's very litigious in the emergency room. You miss something, and uh, geez, you have a real problem. And so a lot of the things that we do may be things that will cover us so that we don't get sued. Now, that's, that's an important concept to look at. However, when you look at the hospital bill that you get, okay, and you try to go through one of those charge masters, I mean, you have to be a PhD in mathematics to do that, to figure out where all the charges came from. But you don't see in there a charge for malpractice for covering yourself so that you don't get sued. But yet, it's, it's a very important uh, issue. The second uh, uh, place that they'll say cost is uh, uh, insurance companies, you know? Uh, third will be uh, pharmaceutical companies, and maybe uh, doctors will be in there somewhere. But you see, everybody has a different perception of what drives the healthcare cost. But to show you what the difference is, we spend about 18% to 19% of gross national product on health care. Germany spends about 12%. Healthcare economists say that that's probably reasonable in terms of gross national product. However, you know what the difference is between Germany and the U.S.? Anybody got an idea? How about $1 trillion? That's a lot of money. I'm sure that maybe somebody in this room can think about millions, right? And maybe you can think about billions. I, I don't know. 
But thinking about trillions, that just boggles my mind. I can't even conceive of it. But if you put it another way, think about what you were doing a million seconds ago. Anybody got an idea of what you might have been doing? How about carving turkey? And if we go from a million to uh, a billion, how many know what you might have been doing a billion seconds ago? Does anybody have a 24 or 25 year old? You were giving birth. <laughs> now try to conceive of what you were doing a trillion years, a trillion seconds ago. Anybody got an idea of where we were? We, we were probably evolving from one cell organisms. And that's a lot of uh, conception uh, that you have to think about. But the problem is that our health care costs are rising. Pretty soon it's going to get to the point where we can't sustain that. And at that point in time, who knows what's going to happen in this country? And it's important that we get a handle on this, and I'm not sure how to do that, and I'm not going to pretend I have any idea of how to do that. But where the United States stands, we spend a lot of money, but yet what we get for that money we spend is not what I think everybody would want. The folks in Canada, when I was there last year giving a lecture, uh, and I had dinner with uh, my wife and I sat next to a couple uh, from Canada, and we had a nice conversation, and they said, you guys in America are really foolish. You, you complain about this health care system that we have, and my husband's had, he's had a knee replaced, he's had a hip replaced, I have a pacemaker, I see my doctor when I need to, there's no problem, and I haven't had to pay for it. He says we may have a little inconvenience of maybe having to wait a little bit because somebody comes in with an emergency, which put my husband's hip operation off a few weeks. However, it was done, he's doing well, I'm doing well. So you have to think about that. So anyway, that trillion dollars is a big, big number. Now how do we get that down is a, is a big story. Uh, we, have seen so, uh, we have seen some benefits though. Healthcare costs uh, really are coming down. In, 2000, in, two, in 1998 to 2000, we didn't see any change. Since 2000, we've seen some decrease in terms of costs. And you look at the other uh, graph on the right side, you can see the percent of, of spending on Medicare beneficiaries, which is the biggest part of government spending. You can see that that's gone down. <coughs> now, let's get back to heart failure. Of the new guidelines that came out in 2013, 300-page document, 900 references. Uh, when you boil it down, I'm going to give you the three slides that I want you to really take with you and, and know. Phenotypes in the treatment of heart failure, you can see here, going through A all the way th through D, and the therapies for those. I'll let you uh, peruse those at, at your leisure. One of the important things to understand is of the treatments that we give, what number of patients do we need to treat to save one life? And we figure that anywhere from 50 to 75 patients that we treat to save a life is probably a good thing. So when you look at heart failure, ACE inhibitors, the number needed to treat, 26. Beta blockers, nine. Aldosterone antagonists, six. Hydralazine, isosorbidonitrate, in a fixed dose combination, seven. There's one other thing to say in terms of the uptake of the use of that medicine, uh, probably only at about 26%. So there's a lot of opportunity to make a difference in the lives of patients. But there's also a fight that you have to wage in order to get the medicine. And, and too often I've had to call medical directors and say, hey, you were trying to re refuse this medication for a patient who obviously qualifies for this medicine and is a, a class one indication. And after a bit of discussion, they consent. 
And this is the pharmacologic treatment of uh, stage C. I think that's important. I want you to take a look at that. Uh, hospital discharge. Lisa is going to say a bit more about hospital discharge and the things that we need to do. Remember, again, this is an aha moment for our patients that we get a chance to really make a difference. And she's going to talk about some strategies and team effort that you need to have in order to accomplish what we need to accomplish. Uh, some of the common drugs for heart failure, she's going to talk about more. But uh, it's kind of interesting where we've come from and where we're going back to. Uh, we have started out with, uh, back in 1981, uh, 1982, when uh, VHEF-1 and VHEF-2 trials were published by that time, uh, we were on the vasodilator therapy for heart failure. Along came consensus, and consensus was the trial that showed ACE inhibitors were the treatment of choice, and we certainly got away from that. So interestingly enough, all the newer things that we've done in heart failure over the last 10 to 15 years have produced zero, and now we're back to vasodilator therapy. Uh, there's a new drug that's probably going to come out that uh, uh, is a vasodilator that's been tested in Eastern Europe, and just keep your eyes on that because it will make a big difference in terms of how we approach heart failure. Uh, one of the important things, and that is when we treat our patients, we have to understand we're not all the same. There are differences and that we need to exploit those differences because it improves the quality of health for, for us all. And, and exploiting those differences uh, is very important, particularly in heart failure. In heart failure in African Americans, as I said before, uh, we have an overall 50% higher uh, uh, rate of heart failure than whites. Uh, it is of earlier onset, and it is certainly uh, a higher morbidity. Uh, it's 1.8 time, uh, times higher mortality uh, in African American men versus Caucasian men, 2.4 times higher mortality in African American females versus Caucasian females, a two-fold greater risk of hospitalization, and 50% uh, uh, of heart failure patients uh, have this at an earlier onset, just like in hypertension. So remember, hypertension is still a very important uh, risk factor and something that we should concentrate on. Now, what makes this uh, really important for us is looking at this trial, the AHEF trial. It's the only trial that's ever been done in a minority population. It's the only trial that's ever had one trial which then made guidelines as a class one indication. Remember, multiple randomized uh, clinical trials needed to be done in order to prove the hypothesis that would give a, a drug or a recommendation for treatment a stage one indication. So this is the AHAP trial. 1,050 patients, 161 centers in the U.S., and the enrollment you see here. What was important about this trial is the 43% reduction in mortality. This is on top of standard medical therapy. Now, you can go back in all the heart failure trials you want to go back to. You will not find mortality data that approaches this. And a 39% reduction in first hospitalizations for heart failure. These are very important things. And I remember when the drug first came out, I was there when the presentation was made of this trial and then talking about this around the country to physicians. And I got a lot of kickback. And one of the kickbacks was this. Now, why should we be studying a drug just for some ethnic population? You know, this is ridiculous. And after I'd listened to a few of these, and I, I'd say, okay, that's a good point. But guess what? We've been studying white males for I don't know how long. Uh, you didn't say anything about that before, did you? Not females, by the way. So that uh, this recommendation for treatment has a class 1A recommendation. And that's very important. It's important, too, to understand that there's a bioequivalence problem. You know, some hospitals and some uh, insurance companies want to push back on uh, the use of the drug. 
However, the FDA in this letter, if you don't have it, I'm sure that uh, we can get that for you, which says that there's no bioequivalence, that this drug has, uh, uh, it's proven, and it failed in, in VHEF2, the combination, uh, using them separately. So there's plenty of data which suggests that uh, this is a very important drug for us to use, particularly in our minority population of African Americans. The other important uh, thing that was covered in that study is the Minnesota Living with Heart Failure Questionnaire. Uh, folks did extremely well with this, and they showed dramatic improvement. One of my patients in the study, I almost get emotional when I think about her, she was just about housebound and sometimes bedridden. And after she got into the study, she came back to the office about six weeks or two months. First thing she did, she grabbed me. She gave me a big hug. That was an emotional moment for me. And she said to me, she says, now I can walk my grandchildren to school. And I couldn't do that. So that, uh, you don't have many of those, let me tell you. Uh, but that was a, uh, was a, uh, a very, a very uh, life-changing experience for me to show what we can do uh, and that we still have the power to do the things in terms of taking care of our patients. You know, oftentimes we get all sorts of bad publicity as far as physicians are concerned that we're doing this, that, and the other. But that's a, a great experience. And I get some similar experiences when I open up a patient's artery in the cath lab when they come in with a heart attack. But that was uh, even better. Now, I want to present you with this case study. Uh, all of you remember Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And uh, he was, uh, had uh, three terms as President of the United States. But what wasn't known was that he had some health problems which weren't addressed. Uh, he had long-standing hypertension. The map of post-World uh, post War II Europe was really defined on the basis of his health problems. Because in the afternoon, he used to go to sleep, and Stalin would sit back and look and say, every time Roosevelt would get a little sleepy, then he would start pushing for what he wanted in terms of defining borders uh, uh, in Europe. And here's his, uh, he had hypertension. He, was re he went to an outside cardiologist, a Dr. Bruin, uh, who found him cyanotic, breathless. He had an enlarged heart and a blood pressure at that time, 186 over 108. He diagnosed him as hypertensive heart disease. He wanted to give him digitalis, but guess what? His own doctor, the Surgeon General, said no. Interestingly enough, his, surgeon, his doctor, the Surgeon General, was an ear, nose, and throat doctor. And in 1945, as you well know, he suffered a, a stroke and subsequently died. Uh, now, and what they said is that FDR's hypertension and heart failure came out of the blue. Uh, and that was the articles that appeared in the paper. Shortly after his death, his records somehow disappeared. Amazing. But, uh, and here's some of the medical data. You look at his blood pressure at various points in time, uh, D-Day, elections, Yalta, uh, and it's kind of interesting tracing his record from 35 until he passed away in, in 45. Uh, so, you know, again, emphasizing hypertension as a very important etiologic factor, it's extremely important. Uh, for those of us who are African Americans in this country, heart failure ought to be as important to us as is hypertension. And we ought to do everything we can to provide the patients that we take care of with all the guideline-directed medical therapies that have been shown and proven to be effective in the treatment of both hypertension and heart failure. And as I said from the ADHERE database, when you look at that database for all the patients who are on all those therapies, you can't tell the difference between white and black. And so you go a long way to eliminating disparities in at least two very important medical problems. Now I'm gonna leave you with a quote from Winston Churchill. 
I got a lot of quotes from Winston Churchill. I kind of like him because he was hes sort of a funny guy. But anyway, uh, the further you can look back, the farther forward you're likely to see. And I'll leave you with that. Uh, thank you, Dr. Repson. That was a great, great talk. Um, I actually come to you as a peer, as a friend, as a nurse. And I know each one of you have come from your own hospital across the country to meet up um, about heart failure. And, you know, why are, why are we all here? Why, why is it that we have this annual meeting? And it's really because heart failure is kind of a big deal. I mean, you know, a lot of our patients are living with heart failure, 6 million Americans, 15 million uh, Europeans. Our hospitalizations are, are increased due uh, to heart failure. And um, those that are discharged from the hospital, 20% are readmitted within 30 days. So you all are probably here from each of your hospitals saying, okay, I want you to go and learn. I want you to come back to your entity, and I want you to fix this readmission problem. <laughs> so how do we do it, and uh, where do we go from here? It's a good question. When we speak about minorities and heart failure also, we know that African Americans have a 25% increase uh, with the heart failure diagnosis. And we know, as Dr. Robinson spoke, the men and women of African Americans are almost double the Caucasian uh, diagnosis of heart failure in, in Caucasian men and women. Um, they're usually underrepresented in clinical trials, as we know, and therefore they go undetected and they progress. So they usually come to your clinics in stage C you know, in stage B, and, and, and now we're left with kind of sweeping up what has been missed. We know they also carry um, increased risk factors with them, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, uh, than whites and Hispanics. Um, you, you're all here because you love heart failure, and you know it. Uh, you know that these drugs that have been um, trialed and trialed over again Decrease, uh, decrease mortality and increase survival in heart failure. We know that ACE inhibitors and ARBs are extremely important uh, when the patient leaves the hospital. We know uh, isosorbide dinitrate hydralazine is important in the African American community. We know there's beta blockers that have to be prescribed. Those things we know. Why do we know? Because the, all the smart people before us did all these clinical trials. They put all the patients in the, and, and consented them and tested them and and now we know ACE inhibitors, the beta blockers, the, the, this is what we know before. And then you know, obviously, it's not only the diabetes and, and heart disease and obesity that, that runs in your family, it's that no one runs in your family. That's the problem. <laughs> so, you know, when, when we're dealing with heart failure patients um, and, and on discharge, we know that physicians need to follow these guidelines. They need to you don't have to reinvent the wheel. It's already been done for us. We just need to have a way to have the patients take the meds and be prescribed the meds. If you do two therapies, increase survival rate. Do three, four, it gradually gets better. So we have to have some way to have the patients take the meds, follow the re uh, recommendations, and, and continue to do better, but to decrease the remissions. Sorry. The, the cost versus the quality, that's where we kind of run into gray. Um, when the New England Journal of Medicine uh, published this in 2010, what they show is basically hospitals that had an increased readmission rate had a lower mortality rate. So it's like, what do you want us to do? Decrease readmissions or increase our quality? Like, it, it's kind of, it is gray right now, and, and we are in the gray area. So. I know that my administrator came to me and he patted me on the back and he said, Lisa, right now uh, we have a problem with our percentage of readmissions and um, I want you to fix it. Uh, All right. Sounds like a plan. <laughs> <laughs> and that's probably what each one of your administrations have done to you. So we're going to do it together and we're going to figure out how to, how to uh, increase our survival rate with these patients and decrease our, our readmissions. So when we do... Um, our guideline directed medical therapy with our medications, we know that it decreases uh, uh, mortality, incre uh, decreases the workload, improve, improves uh, myocardial performance. We all know that. And when we look at the Heart Fire Society of America and the American Car Car College of Cardiology, sorry, and the American Heart Association, what they say is we need to come at it as a team approach. We need to have multidisciplinary members 
get together, focus on our heart failure patient, and then improve um, their outcomes. So you ask, well, we kind of already do that anyway with all the patients in the hospital. But this is different from what we did in our hospital. We came up with this clinical excellence team. It was a group that was solely focused on heart failure. Um, we had physician champions. We had social workers and case managers that were specifically for the heart failure patient. And what we did is we developed some order sets, some standardized order sets. When the patient comes into the ER, they're directly uh, identified. And the process starts at that point. There's nutritional consults. There's palliative care consults that start immediately. And then we follow the patient through discharge. At that point, when they go home, you want to know, are they ready to go home to their families? Are they, do they need to go to a SNF? Do they need to go to uh, acute care? acute care. Who is going to take care of these patients? Um, that's why it's really important that we found to get the family involved. You have to have a support person in that patient's care that's going to tell you, okay, I am going to be responsible for Mrs. Smith. I will help her understand and follow her guidelines. And because Mrs. Smith probably is not interested in anything that you're saying. So you find someone that's, you know, going to take a hold of her and help her through. Um, we tried to take the medications uh, on a mission, which most of you do, document them, reconcile them, and as they come through the hospital, things change. There's titrations, there's differences, but then on discharge, sometimes our physicians or providers were very busy and, and rushing, and they just continue the meds. So the patient came in on a diuretic, they leave on diuretic, but that diuretic through the course of time has changed doses over and over. So it was important for our team to make sure that the, the discharge dosage of that medication is now new and changed. The patient gets a new prescription. They're educated on the differences. Mrs. Smith tells me, I don't want to take that pill at afternoon. I'm up in the bathroom all night long. But if you tell her, Ms. Smith, if you take that medication, it's going to help you see your grandson graduate because you're going to feel better. And maybe she'll say, oh, okay, you know, I kind of get it. I think we have to break it down to our heart failure patients and really st spend time with them, and that's what the clinical excellence team has done. They give these patients extra time. Um, having follow-up uh, immediately post-discharge, and if you come from a hospital and, and uh, like I do, the physicians are very busy. It's very hard to get that patient to be seen within a week. So what are we going to do? You know, I think having a patient see some sort of health care provider within that week of discharge and, and prompt follow-up afterwards makes a huge difference, whether it be, you know, the primary care, the cardiologist, home health, cardiac rehab. They need to touch base with someone. We at our hospital don't have a heart failure um, clinic. And that was a problem. So we have to develop a team that's going to be, um, you know, responsible to call Ms. Smith. Hey, Ms. Smith, this is Lisa. You know, I'm just checking in with you. How do you feel? What's going on with you lately? You know, having someone at least speak to them about symptoms that they may be experiencing that they don't associate with heart failure. And, you know, why do we care? Because our government says we have to care. They're not going to pay us They're, if we don't you know, tackle this big elephant in the room. Um, it does improve the quality of life of the patient, and it does overall improve the financial well-being of our health care. Um, readmissions do account for 25% of the Medicare payments, I think as Dr. Robinson mentioned, uh, billions and billions of dollars. Um, I don't remember carving a turkey, and I, nor do I have a 24-year-old child. So I think this, you know, the numbers are just huge. So this may be similar to what you give your patients um, when they're in the hospital with heart failure. It's a chart. It's great. It's in color. The patients, um, it's easy to read. I ask them to put it on the refrigerator. So when they go to open the refrigerator, they, they can remember maybe something that I've told them while they were in the hospital. You know, green is good when you're having no weight gain. You know, on, on part of our education is to tell them, obviously you know this, weigh yourself daily. Tell them why they're weighing themselves daily. If they don't understand the fact that if they gain a pound or two or three in a day, five in a week, that it's a big, <coughs> big deal, they're, gonna, they're not going to care. They're just going to start writing the numbers down. The numbers are going up. and they, they, Well, Lisa told me to write them down. I'm just going to write them down. <laughs> and they're just going higher and higher and higher, right? So, you know, you ask Miss Smith, hey, Miss Smith, when, you, when, you, when you're contacting her, how do you feel? Do you have any heart failure symptoms? No, I'm great, Lisa, I have no heart failure symptoms. 
perfect. How has it been going out to your mailbox to get your newspaper? Oh, Lisa, I have not done that in probably a day or so because I get so tired and I can't even put my slippers on. My feet are so big. I don't know, you know, they hurt. Okay, Miss Smith, this, these are heart failure symptoms. You've kind of missed the boat. So let's go back and re-educate you. Um, I think that's an important part is when they're in the hospital, when you're talking to them, tell them to repeat what you said to them. It's, it's really important. A lot of times they're, uh-huh, mm-hmm, yep, mm, see you later. As soon as she leaves, I get to go home. Uh-huh, they're just like nodding at you. But you ask them to repeat what you've said to them, then they have to think about it. Okay, I didn't hear anything that you said. I was just waiting for you to leave so I could go home. Can you repeat what you said? Oh, yeah, I'll repeat. You know, I have time for you. Um, so when they get into the yellow, tell them, this is important. These are all um, progressions of the symptoms that you may uh, have that may put you back in the hospital. Call your physician when you get at some point. Um, you know, he may just change your medication over the phone. That is a simple task before they have to come all the way back into the hospital. Now, no one's getting paid. Um, so a little bit about the education, you know, we all educate our patients, but I think part of the clinical excellence team was to sit and focus. Um, it was to kind of, you know, eliminate some of the gaps that we were having. I mean, because we, we pretty much do educate and, and treat most of our patients the same way, but when you have a team that's completely focused, people are being responsible. You know, we, we are going to where there was a drop. We are talking to um, the nursing staff. We are talking to the physicians about what we're expecting of them, and then we're actually sp spending time with the patient. So we talk about, you know, all these educational points that you, you guys probably hit, but when you talk to a patient about, hey, you know, how, how is your diet? How do you eat salt? And she's Miss Smith's like, no way. I don't ever shake salt on anything I eat, never. And you're like, oh, that's, that's amazing. So, you know, you use Mr. Dash or kind of what, you know, how do you maintain your diet? And she says, Lisa, you know, I, I live by myself. You know, I, it's kind of hard, so I do these quick meals, but I don't shake salt on any of them. I usually microwave a hot dog and put some ketchup on it, and I am good to go. And you're like, hmm. All right. Got to go back and talk to Ms. Smith about hot dogs and sodiums and, you know, the cans that she eats, the vegetables. She thinks she's very healthy eating these vegetables, but yet this, the can of green beans has thousands of grams of sodium. So, you know, I think breaking it down to their level and really, you know, giving them the time and effort and, and, and telling them to t teach back to you what you're, what you're explaining to them is, is important. And I can't stress through the clinical excellence team what we've gained over time is, is having that family involved. You have to have that support person that's going to be with that heart failure patient because I think heart failure alone is a huge, huge issue, and it's hard to maintain. I mean, these patients are on multiple medications. I don't know if you've ever tried to take a twice-a-day medication in your life or even a three-time-a-day medication. It is hard. I miss it frequently. So, you know, that's some of the, the challenges that we face with these patients is that they're on a bunch of different things. So if you have a family or a support person that can help this patient, give them a pill uh, box, you know, set their pills for them, have them purchase foods in the grocery store on the outskirts, where, the, where the, the fruits and the vegetables are, instead of focusing on the inner portion of the grocery store, it's a huge, huge help to them. Um, another issue with the clinical excellence team, as, as over time what we realized is we didn't have a palliative care team at our hospital, and you have to have a palliative care team for heart failure or your chronic disease patients. It's a must. So when you get a patient that is presented with heart failure in their 40s and 50s, stage A and B, it's important to then sit with them at that set point in time and tell them what heart failure is, how it's going to progress, how they can help themselves live longer and survive longer. Instead of getting a patient at 88 years old, she's in stage C, and she's kind of missed the whole opportunity to improve her health over time, and now you give her a timeline Mrs. Smith, this is birth, this is death. This is what our palliative care team does. Where are you on the timeline between birth and death? And a lot of times these patients that are 80, 70, 9 years old with heart failure put themselves smack in the middle. And you're like, you know, that's a missed opportunity. So the palliative care team basically captures this chronic disease firsthand, first admission, talks to them about where they are and how it's going to progress and how they should see themselves in reality. Because a lot of times that's the part that's missed. 
you know, we do go in, obviously, quality of life and other options. Hospice, as Dr. Robinson said, I mean, it's not a bad thing. It's actually the most important thing, I think, because you have the, you know, psychosocial support. You have an idea of what the plan is going to be. Um, and then you have to make sure uh, you have some peer-based influences. So, you know, I think when you when you talk about peer-based influences, you, you, you speak of the challenges. So I think if you have patients that can join together and talk about their, their chronic disease and kind of what's helped them and, and what's made it better. And they say, you know, I'm taking this medication that my doctor gave me two doses to make one, like Dr. Robinson was saying in the African-American population. And then the other patient says, well, I have that same drug, but it's a one, what's a one pillar. And they're like, wait a minute, let me go back and talk to my physician to get that combo drug as one. That you know, increases the, the compliance because now they're not taking multiple meds over multiple times. Um, we right now have, you know, the San Diego Fair. So uh, we have fried butter and fried <laughs> chicken legs and fried whatever, Oreo cookies. And it's hard for these patients. That is the challenges that we face because they are coming into a world where it's so much cheaper to buy a 99 cent hamburger at McDonald's than it is to buy, you know, the outskirts of the grocery store to find something healthy. Um, so that's that's what we what we face. We also face the patient uh, that Dr. Robinson obviously takes care of uh, frequently, and he, you know he lives in Southeast San Diego, and he he likes to smoke a little wacky weed here and there, and um, he likes to go to Miss Pee Wee's uh, Southern Fried Chicken when he smokes wacky weed, and now he's into the hospital, he, and it's like a cycle. He does that frequently. So I'm from Virginia, and we deal with that all the time. Right. I'm from North Carolina, so I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> you know, you, you, your family tells you, I eat vegetables, I eat collard greens. They're delicious. But then you realize that they've been cooked with the huge salt and the fat and the ham, and the, they make it taste good. Right. Yeah, I, it, it's a problem. That is the, the challenge of the heart failure patient because they have all the odds against them. They, the food is their enemy, and, and you know, the medications are tough, so that's something that we have to, as a team, as a clinical excellence team, what we've worked on is try to educate the patients and tell them, you know, how important it is to maybe skip out on that, you know, food category just to see your grandchild graduate or, you know, to go dancing or to walk your kids to school. It's going to, it's, it's worth the effort. So, you know, social support and networking is important. And that's what we all do as a team. That's what we did. Simplify the uh, regimens, make sure we provide the education, make sure we take the time, uh, make sure these patients have their reconciled meds, make sure they go home with a prescription, they understand what they're taking. You know, if you're taking a list of medications and you don't have enough money to maybe take them all, you know, what is the most important? What can you not miss? I mean, you know, we have to, we have to kind of, fill in the gaps at some point because there are going to be gaps and that's our job and your job um, and then your hospital administration will s hopefully say good job as mine did. Any questions? Thank you very much. We happy to answer any questions at this time. One of the things I want to just point out as we go forward in the future, and the reason I put the slide of Dr. Martin Luther King up, and that is some of the patients who need our help uh, are not going to be able to get it. Uh, those states that opted out of the Affordable Health Care Act, uh, those patients in those states which have a significant portion, maybe up to 25 percent of the poor in this country, may not be able to get access. And for those of you who are in those states to take care of patients in what we call uh, safety net hospitals, you may find your hospital closing because it just will not be able to support uh, the, the patients that it services because of the financial constraints. So that's what I wanted to point out. And one of the things I might uh, mention, uh, as a cardiologist, we're, we're uh, very uh, keenly aware of the medicines you have to go out of the hospital on post-intervention. They're the big five, as we call them. And just as everybody is focused on that, because if you're not focused on that, your hospital will get dinged financially. And so we have Lisa, who tracks me and makes sure that all of my patients go home on these medicines. We ought to be able to do the same thing, and we are going to do that in terms of heart failure. 
these patients need to go home on all the medicines that they can go home on uh, as uh, their clinical condition allows so that we can prevent the readmissions just based on the fact that the patient has the, the medicines that they should have. So yes, ma'am. A question. Um, I know we teach a lot about diet and we teach people what to eat and how to rinse their vegetables and all these different things, but, um, and maybe I'm doing it for so long I'm feeling defeated, but um, I want to know if, if anybody else does something a little different. Uh, I think the terminology of meeting people where they are. So, you know, if you've ever taken a patient with low income to the grocery store, they can't afford what you're talking about, and we often do that. And so when you look at that, there's no money left to buy what we feel that they should have. So um, sometimes I sort of give up on that. I know they're going to eat that hot dog, so I tell them to take an extra diuretic on that day. There's nothing to surround, you know, there's no evidence for this. And so um, maybe don't throw anything at me that that's what I necessarily do. But after seeing pe these people for years, and some of them weeks at a time, you sort of figure out, okay, this is the best I can do. And so um, my question is, is there anything that you all do um, sort of creatively in your office about these types of patients? Well, let me uh, just comment. First of all, uh, don't get discouraged. Uh, that's, you, we don't want you to ever give up hope. Uh, number two, there's a lot of things that uh, I do a lot of stuff in the community and one of the things that the community folks have started doing is having uh, these neighborhood gardens where they're uh, growing vegetables and, and sometimes they produce enough that they're bringing them to uh, 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 markets on the weekend where they are able to sell stuff that's pretty reasonably priced. Uh, so that I would encourage that. There are a lot of things that go on outside of hospitals and communities uh, that uh, you, know, you need to make some contact with because they'll be very helpful. They show folks some things that they can do in terms of growing their own food and, uh, and sharing some of that information with other folks. And you'd be surprised. We see all these, you know, sometimes traveling around San Diego, I see a lot of these uh, gardens that come up. And uh, the one patient that she talked about that goes to Mrs. Pee Wee's is my patient. And, uh, he passes a few of these gardens, by the way, uh, on his way to Mrs. Pee Wee's. But uh, I would encourage that. You know, there, there are a lot of things that happen outside the hospital. Uh, for those hospital large systems like Baylor, you can do that. It's a bit different in private practice. Uh, private practice, uh, my feeling is it's been under attack for the last 15 to 20 years. Okay? When I started in practice, I got a few gray hairs probably less than 20% of physicians were owned or controlled by large systems. Today, it's about 70%. Uh, and uh, there are lots of uh, tremendous uh, forces that are going on out in the private world. Uh, it's very difficult for, for folks to even practice. Uh, and so for those who can see an opportunity to work with communities and doing some of these things, uh, it's very important. I, I work with a lot of ministers in Southeast San Diego, and uh, some of whom are my patients, but it's important to encourage some things that they can do. So I don't want anyone to ever give up. And again, I want to thank all of you because you make the mission of what we have to do possible. And that should not ever be underemphasized. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. Yes, ma'am. I uh, work for the VA, and not only do they not provide Vidal, but they are on the half tablet system, so our patients get double the dose and then are requested to cut the tabs in half. And it's all about cost saving. So did I understand you to say that using hydrolysis and nitrate was not equivalent, or could you comment on that a bit? Yeah, there, there's not an equivalent. You, you, the, the study, if you go to, to the uh, VHEV2 study, uh, done by Jay Cohn out of University of Minnesota, it showed that it was a negative study. Uh, Peter Carson, one of Jay Cohn's fellows, 10 years after that study, published the data looking at about 126, 129 African Americans who were in that study that 
did show promising results. And that's how Bideal came about. The initial company that had it was Nitromed. They launched the product. But unfortunately, the uptake was not great, and the price was a little bit expensive. Uh, the most important thing is you can point to the VA that the FDA has said there is no bioequivalence with the other drugs used in combination with two different pills. So, uh, you know, you have to make sure that the VA uh, can be as responsible as the rest of the nation should be in terms of getting the right medicines for the right people for the right reasons. And maybe they should do it a little bit more timely, too, and that's what they're under attack for. Yes, ma'am. Well, uh, as you well know, a JNC-8, late as we call it, was published <laughs> in December. There's uh, been a lot of controversy about that. That would take a whole nother discussion. Uh, but if you, if you look at things, we've made a lot of gains in terms of uh, decreasing mortality over the last several years. Uh, there are many reasons for that, one of which is we are seeing better control of blood pressure. We are seeing better control of lipids. We're seeing people in California who are stopping smoking and cities that have adopted no smoking policies. There's a lot of reasons for that. I do not see a reason why we should be pushing back to, to, to raise the blood pressure goals when it may be that those who need it most will be insufficiently treated. And so uh, I, for one, do not believe in that. Again, when, when you look at it in this country, uh, hypertension is really a, a black problem. 46% of African Americans in this country have hypertension. So that if we're going to push back and we are overrepresented in heart failure, 6 million heart failure patients, 900,000 plus African Americans, are we going to push back from the blood pressure goals? I don't think so. And, and so, uh, a lot of groups have decided, and there will be a publication coming out in November from the American Heart Association, the American College of Cardiology, with their recommendations for blood pressure. And in the interim, since JNC-8 has been published, they go back to previous recommendations, not adopting these new ones. Yes, ma'am. Yes, thank you, Dr. Robertson and Ms. Alvarez for your very wonderful presentation. Uh, and to the... Um, my colleague over on the other side of the room who is losing hope, a couple of things that we've done, in, uh, and, and please, as you said, to stay encouraged. A couple of things that um, I'd like to just share, because sometimes we make assumptions, um, and we talk about you know, diet, and we talk about lifestyle, and oftentimes we don't necessarily connect what's going on with the patient and what's going on with uh, medical therapies and, and treatment. Um, there is a couple of, uh, uh, of documentaries that I would love for my colleagues to take um, note of. One is unnatural causes. Is inequity making us sick? Um, it's put out by Golden Reel. You can Google it. It talks about social determinants of health. When you talked about the health of, um, when you talked about the cost of health care, I was hoping that you would tie together not only the cost of health care with poverty and people who have high demand and low control. And when you have high demand and low control, it oftentimes affects the health. Um, and also the fact that racism is a variable that has been included in many medical studies that talk about why certain people have disparities in health care. The other documentary is put out by the Association of Black Cardiologists. It's called Before You Eat the Church Food. And, <laughs> and, and in the black community, um, we oftentimes associate um, soul food um, with food that makes us feel better in the heart, but it's affecting our heart. It's, it's killing us, and so therefore this documentary, um, it, it actually talks about um, how the food is affecting our health, but it also gives some very good um, examples of how um, some churches and some communities have become proactive in addition to 
um, gardens. They're also talking about exercise and how we can look at the foods that we associate with soul and it's so wonderful, but no, those are foods that were used for survival that we've um, adopted as delicacies, but now we know that they are not good. So please, unnatural causes, um, is not equity making us sick? And before you eat the church food are documentaries that I would like to, you all to promise that you will take a look at. Thank you. I think uh, making appropriate food choices is very important. But I think there's a push that I, I think I saw on television recently about going back to some very basic uh, uh, food elements uh, that are very healthy and that uh, uh, it would lead to better uh, health outcomes for, for folks. So I think there's lots of choices. In my patient population, I've been in practice in San Diego for almost 30 years. In my patient population, I got some great cooks, I want to tell you. And uh, what we've been able to see is a change in how they prepare foods now. Uh, I get a lot of stuff, and the patient's very proud to bring it in and saying, this is how we made this, and it, it doesn't have any salt, it doesn't have any ham hocks, it doesn't have this, that, and the other. And uh, uh, we encourage that. One of the things we've been able to do is take some of those folks in the practice and say, why don't you share that with your neighbors and show them how to do the very same thing in terms of preparing foods that would be healthy for not only you but for them, and you can share that uh, with them. And so, you know, that process of sharing, you know, the best thing you can do is not only sharing but taking something that you have and give it away. Uh, I think that's the Christian thing to do. And you'd be surprised how much difference it would make. I'll stop there. Yes, ma'am. This is just a quick question. Why doesn't the drug Bidil, when it's taken in two separate medications, why doesn't that work? It's going into your body. Except I don't understand why it has to be combined. Well, there, there's very good pharmacokinetic data that's uh-huh. available. If you look at the, uh, you go back and Google uh, Bidil, uh-huh. and you'll see the pharmacokinetic data. Uh, you go back and Google the AHEF trial. Uh, you can see that data for all those outcomes I talked about. You can go back and Google uh, VHEF2, and you can see it was a negative trial. Uh, Caucasians in that trial did not fare well. So there's not a simple answer, it sounds like. There, there's, <laughs> there's not a simple answer, but there's a lot of facts. Okay. The I fact of the matter is, it is because people aren't being compliant because it's harder to take two drugs. Or no, in trials, uh, totally very, biochemical. In trials, very patients are very compliant. Okay. In the AHEF trial, we had greater than ninety percent compliance. Uh, we had few patients that were lost to follow up. It was a very well done study. Patients were on standard medical therapies, uh, you know, through throughout that trial. So. Uh, if you go back and look at the data on that trial, it's very significant, the outcome uh, that uh, the trial produced. And so I think that it's very important. We look at those kinds of data all the time. We make decisions on what we do based upon data. Uh, and we're data-driven. So uh, I'd encourage you to go back and look at that. The drugs separately are not equivalent to the drug Bidil and you look at the pharmacokinetics, which probably will explain that very well for you. And then the most important thing is, what's the outcome? Okay, thank you. Any other questions? That's very good. We do that in my office. Uh, my wife runs my office, would you believe it? I still love her. We get along. Uh, sometimes she loves me, sometimes she doesn't. But uh, she pushes in terms of uh, what we need to do. We have all sorts of charts that we use for teaching, one of which is teaching about salt. There's white salt, there's brown salt, there's red salt, and there's yellow salt. Most patients didn't even think about that. But when you think about that, you look at the brown salt, soy sauce. We have a very ethnically diverse population in southeast San Diego that we take care of. And so... uh, they enjoy a lot of things that have soy sauce. Uh, we have uh, a large Hispanic population. Uh, there's all sorts of things that, uh, that they use which have salt. So uh, showing them all the things that, uh, that have salt and, make, and pointing out these things, you'd be surprised the changes that we see over time. 
and, and that's uh, very encouraging. Uh, but it, it takes a while. You know, it's uh, as a young lady who's not here said that she's getting discouraged. Well, uh, sometimes I was thinking about, yeah, I was being a little bit discouraged, and, and then all of a sudden you get that aha moment where you see the light went on in the patient's head, and all of a sudden they understand. And this is after you've done it 10 times and gone over things. Uh, it really makes, uh, it makes a big difference, and you have to hang in there. You have to have the faith that, that what you do is going to be important over time. And, and then to see that happen in front of you is, uh, I mean, it, it makes me want to practice for the next 50 years, let me tell you. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I agree with Lisa. You have to go where your population is. Um, I was going um, through my master's program about four years ago. Uh, me and my best friend that went to school together, um, she's African-American and I'm Mexican-American. She's hypertension case manager and I'm heart failure case manager. And we went as a tandem out to the Baptist church. We did uh, fiestas, health fairs. We went to the beauty shops, because uh, that's a captive audience, especially with the women. <laughs> and they don't mind being there all day, because they are anyway. And you know, we take them aside, give, do a little education. We brought ethnic foods in. And it, it's just amazing what you can do by going out there in the community and, and keep going out. I mean, we just didn't do it one time, because we were going to school, and it was part of our, our uh, master's program. But you know, we continued after we graduated. And, it's, it's just amazing the results you see, the people that come back year after year and they've lost 10 pounds or their blood pressure is down 10 or 15 points because they took the little pamphlet and listened to you as you were talking about a healthy diet. That's great. That's great. We have a question over here. Yeah. Hi. Um, thanks again for the presentation. I think we all encounter a lot of these issues every day. I do do want to return back to the, the Bidel issue because I think there's still um, a seed of doubt within me in terms of Bidel versus the combination therapy on their own. Um, when I look at the research and look at like when they did the head-to-head -head comparisons of Bidel versus uh, combination therapy, I think the evidence, if I understood it, was that the control group or the group that they used um, used different doses of the combinations and were a relatively healthy population as part of VHEFT too, I think. So my concern is that knowing all the patients that I have on the two different medications that they get at $4 a piece, as opposed to Bido, which is really expensive, and to actually put the, the resources to getting it approved by an insurer, I'm not convinced enough just from my looking at the evidence and the research out there that Bido really is the only choice as opposed to the two different medications. And I just, I just feel like I don't want that message, at least for me, to be what people would walk away with from, from this talk. So that's just my thought on Well, that, so. what I would point out to you yeah. is we're all data driven. Right. When consensus came out in 82, mm -hmm. we all said, ah, ACE inhibitors. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have data today which shows better outcome mortality than was had in the AHEF trial. If you go back to VHEF2, right. okay, the overall benefit, the p-value was not there. It was some signs that there was a better outcome in African-American patients, but the numbers were small. Uh, to get this kind of result on a clinical trial that was well done, mm -hmm. I think uh, I don't have anything else to, to say to you except that uh, for those who believe in data, the data is certainly there. For those who believe in looking at uh, uh, the chemistry profile and the, and the PK data, I was a chemistry major in right. college, and the data is there. Uh, so I don't know what else to say to you except that, you know, I think that for the benefit that you can obtain, right. and whether, you know, you, there are a lot of expensive things that we do in terms of medicines right. that uh, may not make that much of a difference. So I think that I would encourage you to look at that and, and make the judgment on the basis of the best thing for the patient, right. not necessarily the best thing that's going to please uh, your rationale for using it or not using it. Oh, no, I believe in, in the combination Medicaid. I mean, I believe in Bidon. I believe in, in hydrolyzine and, and uh, isosorbide dinitrate. It's just the combination and the cost that, you know, we have to make that determination with patients all the time. 
And I think we have to just be careful, especially in situations where you know there's limited means with patients to uh, be very proactively saying that one thing is superior to the other. And I'm just, I'm not sure that that evidence is out there, so. To give you an example, yeah. uh, sometimes I'm around giving talks and I tell folks I can take care of blood pressure in about 60 to 70% of the pe patients on less than $30 a year. Somebody looks at me and says, what? And uh, you forget that we used to have reserping. We used to have that, uh, uh, what was it called, surface, whatever it was. It was a combination of three drugs. Mm -hmm. uh, you take that combination as long as the reserping doesn't go over 0 0.625. Uh, you take that along with hydrochlorothiazide, really that has no data, but it's effective. Uh, you can, uh, in the VA system, get patients under control in about 60 to 70 percent of patients on less than $30 a day. Do we do that? No. So in terms of cost, uh, I'm not sure I want to listen to the argument about cost when we do so many other things that are such costly things. So I, I think what you have to do is do the best thing for your patients. Do the right thing at the right time for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what I stand by. Okay. I hear you. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, ma'am. You have a question? Hey. Uh, well, I have more of a comment. I run a um, community clinic. I'm the sole provider in Jackson, Mississippi. And I did a study on Bideal. Uh, my Bideal patients versus non Bideal. And I can tell you, um, experiences like that lady who can breathe better, walk better, the quality of life we measured really increased with Bideal versus non. Also, the length of stay, the readmission for less than 30 days, Bideal um, was superior over decrease in length of stay, or not length of stay, but readmission within 30 days versus non Bideal. And it, it is, um, you know, in my clinical practice in Jackson, Mississippi, I see a huge difference. Uh, and, and the combination, the fixed dose, I see um, a better result than the separation or one or the other, that kind of thing. Um, with it being three times a day, what I tell my patients, everybody has a cell phone, is to set that alarm mid-afternoon. And when you hear that alarm, that's your Bideal alarm. Take your medicine and go on, and it's really helped with their compliance of the three times a day. Hydrazoline is the three time a day. So, you know, uh, you've got to uh, figure out what you can do to help that patient remember those medicines when it's the mid-afternoon. But I do see quality of life improvement, uh, blood pressure, uh, that kind of thing. I see a, a lot of improvement with that. Well, thank you for the testimony. I might want to uh, add that the average number of pills taken in the AHAF trial was 3.8. Can I add something? I, I don't think that it's not that Bidil is not being ordered. It is being ordered. But when the patient is discharged, patient can't get the medication. So then they order in the um, hydrazoline. And if studies is showing that, that we're getting better outcomes, with patients that's on Bidil, it's just not accessible to them because of insurance purposes. Well, I deal with a lot of insurance companies in San Diego County. I think most of the medical directors for those insurance companies know me by first name. And, uh, uh, you know, I insist that the patient gets what they need to get uh, so that uh, they can do as well as they can. And I think you have to be advocates for your patients, you know. Sometimes you have the problem that the patient with the more expensive medicines is going to reach that donut hole. But uh, I would encourage everyone to look at their patient's medic medication profile. There are a lot of things that you can probably adjust, eliminate, uh, you know, that maybe they don't need. So, uh, but I would encourage you to do the right thing, okay? You uh, make contact with that insurance company medical director who really doesn't want to listen to anybody, uh, but uh, that's the way it is. It, I'll tell you this, it was last year that one of the hospitals I'm on staff at finally put it on their formulary. 
And uh, I told him, uh, you put on the formulary or face being on the front page of the paper. And I showed him the data, and finally they uh, put it on the formulary. But that's ridiculous that you have to do stuff like that. Uh, so anyway, uh, most important thing is that I'll tell you, if you see a good fight, jump in it. <laughs>